Now I'm ready to look at the factors that affecting preload and afterload and how those in turn affect stroke volume and then again affecting cardiac output. So we'll look at both of these, afterload and preload. What do we mean by those? First, let's look at preload. Now preload, remember, has to do with stretch of the, of the ventricles. Stretching those ventricles again, um, lines up the myosin heads with the actin binding sites better. So I get maximum number of myosin heads and bind, binding to the binding sites and the actin. Um, and therefore I get lots of cross bridges and therefore stronger contraction. So anything that increases preload basically will increase the force of the contraction. And so a slight stretch to those ventricles would therefore affect preload. And that in turn then affects end diastolic volume. So in other words, if I have a little bit more blood in there and stretch it, in other words, I have a higher end diastolic volume, I'm gonna stretch that muscle and I get a better muscle contraction. That whole idea is what's basically Starling's law of the heart. If I bring more blood in, then I bring put, pump more blood out in, in its simplest of terms. So if I increase venous return, that is I bring more blood to the heart, bring more blood through the veins into the heart, that means I increase end diastolic volume. I have more blood in the ventricles. That stretches the muscle a little bit in the atriums as well as the ventricles, and I get a bigger contraction, and therefore I get a bigger stroke volume. So basically, how do I get to that increase end diastolic volume? Well, as I mentioned, I can have increased venous return. It's going to have a positive effect on preload or end diastolic volume. How do I get increased venous return? Any one of these things. If I have more blood, then I'm going to have more blood returning to the heart, which increases venous return. If I increase respiration, the negative pressure that is accomplished by inhaling is like a vacuum that really draws the blood up into the blood vessels in the thoracic cavity and thereby bringing more blood back to the heart. Muscle contractions also increase venous return because the muscles in our legs, for example, contract, squeeze those vessels and force blood up to the heart better and therefore increase venous return. And then gravity, if I put my feet up, then the blood is going to move down with gravity or, or towards my chest and therefore increase venous return. So all of these things then can increase venous return and therefore, if I increase venous return, I increase preload and I get a better stroke volume. Other things that can affect uh, preload is, are things like ventricular compliance. If the ventricles are a little bit more stretchy, they have higher compliance. That is compliance, again, think of it as, as how stretchy the muscle and connective tissue of the ventricles are. So the higher the compliance, the more stretchy they are. So they're not stiff, in other words. So if I can increase ventricular compliance, then I can put more blood in. I can increase end diastolic volume, and that's an effect on preload. Um, think of it in other terms if I have heart attacks. If I've had a number of heart attacks, that builds up scar tissue, and that scar tissue can't stretch, so I've lost compliance which then means if I, have, if I don't have as high compliance, I can't get the end diastolic volume up because I can't stretch the ventricles and fill them quite as full. And so that would reduce compliance and therefore preload and therefore stroke volume. Another one that could affect it would be atrial contractility. How hard does the atriums contract? If I can get them to contract harder, then I'm going to pump more blood from the atriums in the ventricles, so therefore that's going to affect preload. It's going to increase end diastolic volume, and therefore I get better stroke volume. So all of these so far have a positive effect on preload or end diastolic volume. Now a couple negatives would be an increase in heart rate. If my heart rate goes really high, so resting's at 72, let's say my heart rate's like up at 150, 160, beats per minute. That doesn't give any time for the ventricles to fill. So I have a decreased filling time. So a high heart rate, it means a lower end diastolic volume, so a lower preload. And therefore, I'm not going to get as good a stroke volume. Okay. 
The other one would be increased inflow resistance. If there's something preventing the blood from entering the heart, so that would be an increase in resistance to flow. It just doesn't want to flow. Maybe a really high hematocrit or constriction of the veins leading to the heart. Anyway, you're looking at that, that would be an increase in resistance to the blood entering the heart. And that would have a negative effect on preload because I would not be able to increase end diastolic volume if I can't get the blood into the heart. So all of these play a role in dealing with preload. Some positive effects increase in end diastolic volume or preload, others having a negative effect on them. Remember that if we increase preload, we're increasing stroke volume. If we increase stroke volume, we increase cardiac output. Now after load is the back pressure exerted by the semilunar valves. So think of it as the pressure in the arteries. So what does the ventricles have to do to overcome that pressure? That would be the after load. Now in healthy individuals, this isn't a major determinant because um, stroke volume is pretty consistent in that way and we're not going to have this big strong afterload. But in hypertensive individuals, you get a reduced ability to eject the blood because the blood pressure is high, which means the ventricles have to push that much harder to try to overcome that pressure. If they can't push harder, then they're going to not eject as much blood and therefore the end systolic volume goes up, which means the system the stroke volume would go down. So it'd be like them climbing a hill. The ventricles have to climb a hill with the, to push the blood out, try to overcome that pressure in the arteries. So that's the end of part two. We'll move on to part three, looking at the factors affecting contractility or calcium levels, which in turn affect stroke volume.